Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to services this morning. Especially want to welcome any visitors we may have. Just ask if you could to fill out the tab on the side of the bulletin. Drop it in the offering plate when it comes around. If you are a first-time guest of ours, we want to welcome you with a special gift bag we've arranged. And uh, if you'll raise your hand up really high at this time, or your barn, or we'll get that to you. One of the ladies will get that to you. As far as announcements today, uh, today, of course, is Father's Day, so I want to welcome all the fathers and thank you for being here. And also, we do have a, a special guest with us today, uh, first time I think she's been here, uh, John and Megan Welch, you got their little baby girl there, Riley Mae Welch is with us today, so give them a big hand. Go ahead. And... <laughs> As far as announcements, other announcements, the uh, Soul and Share will meet Thursday, June 19th at 9 o'clock a.m. Also, don't forget the Children's Day Camp, June 23rd through 27th. That's at First Baptist at uh, Cherokee Village. If you'd like more information on that, uh, just contact the church office here during the week. That's all I have. It's short and sweet today. Have any birthdays this past week? Any anniversaries? Happy My word from the word today uh, for this uh, Father's Day, June fifteenth. Uh, I got a scripture and I got a little. A paragraph here in a book called Celebrate Dad I'd like to read and it really pertains to today's times I think uh, it was once important for fathers to be physically strong they had to build homes and hunt for food with their bare hands they were also called upon to put their physical bodies between their loved ones and predators both animal and human but things have changed now it's more important for a man to be mentally and spiritually strong able to protect his children from assaults on their minds and their faith Dangers that most often are unseen. An extraordinary father draws his strength and courage from his moral character, character and relationship with God. He understands that protecting his family can no longer be done with steel abs alone. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this day we have set aside in this nation to honor fathers and we just thank you for each and every father here and we just pray father father if there is any earthly fathers here that does not know you as their personal savior they will accept him today before it's eternally too late and we just thank you for uh, this service we thank you for this time that we have set aside to worship you and we just thank you for the freedom we have in this country to gather together without fear of persecution we just pray that you just continue to bless this service. You'll just, uh, everything here today, we just pray will glorify your name. Just bless Brother John as he brings a message from your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
y'all will stand with us. We're going to do our praise and worship DVD. Um, he knows my name. I think y'all should all know this. And happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Wonderful day. Like that song, count every one of your blessings. <clears throat> and I know in my life, the tithing seemed to be an obstacle in my life, in early life. And then at 46, when I gave my life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I had a tremendous urge to want to give. So I'm going to read out of 2 Corinthians, starting in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we do appreciate your word as it directs us in the right direction. 
and prosperity and building up treasures in heaven of what we give, dear Lord. He loves a cheerful giver, not just in our tithes, but also in helping the poor and the helpless, dear Lord, as we must reach out in all the nations. Thank you so much for this special day, a Father's Day, especially myself, dear Lord. Thank you for the earthly father you gave me as he was a good man. And I thank you for, for your son, for what he did for us. But the ties now are so easy that we aren't under the laws, dear Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. I can't think of a more appropriate song for Father's Day. You got it? The gates and doors were barred, and all the windows fastened down. We spent the night in sleeplessness, and we rose at every sound. Half in hope of sorrow, half in fear that day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. It was just before the sunrise, we heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. We hurried to the window. We looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sounds of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. So we went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they moved him in the night, and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away, and now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden, and John ran on ahead. We found the stone and the empty tomb, just the way that Mary said. But the winding sheet they wrapped him in was just an empty shell. How or where they'd taken him was more, much more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there. Just what I did not know. 
John believed a miracle. But me, I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high because I'd seen them crucify him. And then I watched him die back inside the house again. The guilt and anguish came. Everything I promised him added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, three times I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't, it couldn't be the same. But suddenly, the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees, and I clung to him, and I cried. He raised me to my feet, and as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from them like sunlight from the skies. Guilt in my confusion disappeared in sweet release. Every fear that I ever had melted into peace. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. Well, good evening. Good. <laughs> Wanted to make sure you were awake. It's good to be here today, and it's always good to be in the Lord's house. And uh, this is Father's Day, so I just want to take this opportunity to say to those of you who are dads, fathers, God bless you. And if you're a godly father, thank you so very much for standing up for truth and what's right. And I would just like all the fathers to please stand during this time. Stand up, dads. Stand up. <laughs> Lord bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, church isn't about me is what I'll be speaking about today. And I've been talking about the church. And uh, we've talked about uh, the importance of uh, membership. We've talked about the importance of doing the right thing. And today I want to talk about church isn't about me. And that's something that we desperately need to get a hold of because so many people want to make everything about themselves. And that's not what it's about. Uh, uh, when children are growing up, like Brienne and Brooklyn, Brienne and Brooklyn uh, is little girls, and they're beautiful, and they'll be here next Sunday, and I look forward to that. But sometimes they fight. They will fight over the most insignificant things like a toy or my lap or what song Sandy will sing at uh, bedtime when she's in the room. And, and it, it's, it's amazing the things they fight over. And uh, it's a good thing that we grow out of that, isn't it? <laughs> that as we become adults, we're no longer selfish and we no longer want our way and we're just uh, mature, and as we become faithful, you got me a little bit hot there, as we become faithful Christians, and isn't it amazing 
that uh, we just want to serve. We never want to be served. We just want to serve. And we quit acting, uh, demanding as children. And we no longer have temper tantrums. We no longer throw fits. We are just perfect. Thank the Lord. The strange thing, however, about church membership is when you become a member, you actually give up your privileges. Did you know that? We don't say, well, now, with my membership, I've got all these privileges, no responsibilities. But when you become a church member, what you do is basically say the needs of others are greater than my needs. You are there to serve, you are there to give, you are there to share, you are there to make a difference in the lives of others, and you don't just come to say, serve me, you are there to sacrifice. You get the picture? The unfortunate thing is we've turned church membership on its head, and it's about me. What can I get? You better serve me. If you don't serve me, then I'm going to get upset. Jesus often uh, confounded his listeners with the words that he would say. And amazingly, even the disciples fussed. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're walking with perfection. And now you're fussing. You're fighting. You have this me first mentality. How could you do that and walk with Jesus? Let's stand and let's see the words in our text in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, starting in verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Father, help us to reconcile truth with our behavior. And help us, Lord, to allow your truth to dictate our behavior. And I pray, Father, that each of us would desire nothing more than to love you and to serve you and to serve others. And that we would never, ever contemplate who's the greatest or who should be served. But we should all serve. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ouch. Ouch! Wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that conversation as Jesus grills them? And did you notice they all just kind of zipped the lip? Nobody said a word because they didn't want to admit what they had been doing. So they just shut up. They were silent. But it would have been great to see the look on their face. To know that Jesus had put them on the spot. And I would have loved to have been there. But as I thought about that, then it hit me. That's me. And that's you. And that's all of us. Because every single one of us have a tendency to be selfish. To want our way. To to do things as we desire to do them. And, and, And to be served rather than to be A servant. So what does it mean to serve? What does it mean to die to yourself? What does it mean to give to others? What does it mean to put others before they put you? What does it mean? What does it mean to say, it's not about me, it's about you, Lord, and here it is, I give it all to you. Well, let's look at the servant motif first. In the servant motif, 57 times in the New Testament, the word servant is used. The word servant is used. 58 times the word serve is used. It means that we are to go the second mile. We are to give ourselves to others. Now, whether that's a household servant in the New Testament or someone that washed the feet or whatever they may have done, the concept was that we're there for the benefit of others. We're not there to benefit our 
sell. So serving is important. Being a servant is important. Do you know we have elected uh, six men to go through training to be deacons? Do you know the word diakonos means that you're a servant? doesn't mean you're a boss. It means that, that you're willing to put the needs of others above your needs, that you're willing to help others and to minister to them and to be there for them when they need you. Now, does that sound like you? Does it sound like you to say, you know what, my needs are not the most important here. The needs of others are more important than my needs. So I'm going to put my preferences on the back burner and serve you. Now, Paul said it very well in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 7. He said, of which I became a minister according to the gift of God given to me by the effective working of his power. The word minister is the word servant. Paul said, I am a servant of the Most High God. I am here to serve God and I'm here to serve others. Now, here's the issue. You'll never find joy in being a member of the local church until you come to the place where you're willing to serve. You'll never, ever find peace. You'll never be content. You'll never be happy because, listen, as long as you want to be filled up and you don't ever want to give out, you become a poison well. And everyone that tries to drink out of that poison well, it's bitterness and it's poison and it will poison them. Listen, that's what Jesus meant, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. What he says is, if you're willing to serve, In the kingdom of God, here's what it's going to do. God is going to take your life. He's going to bless your life. He's going to use your life. And your life will have meaning. Your life will have value. And you'll do something that is bigger than you because you've invested in something besides you. It's not just me, 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 me. Now, as I was planning for this message... uh, I was thinking of a game show. And the survey says, do you know which game show that is? That's right. And the survey says, verse 33 and 34, it says, when they came to Capernaum, they were disputing among themselves, and Jesus says to them, what are you doing? And they kept silent. Because they were disputing about who would be the greatest. Why is it that we have the same problem that the disciples had? Recent surveys show that churches that are dying, churches that are declining, churches that are struggling, churches that are fighting have this me first mentality. They want to be served. They don't want to serve. And because of that, they're dying. And it talked about a number of the of the major reasons these churches are fighting. I'm just going to share some of those with you. Worship wars, number one. How do we worship? Well, I want to worship this way and you want to worship that way. I want to sing songs that are praise and honoring. I I want to sing hymns. I only want to sing psalms. we, we, We fight about that. I want a choir. I know I, I, I want a praise group. No, I want a band. Listen. People just lose their mind on the most insignificant details. And they think, I want my way. Did you hear every one of those? I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. Here's what I want. What does God want? In Matthew's gospel, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says these words. He says that he came, Jesus came for the purpose of serving others. It said in Matthew 2, 2, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. And here it is. We have come to worship him. When we come to church, we're not worshiping the mode of music. We're not worshiping those who are singing or that person who may be preaching. We are worshiping Jesus. That's why we are here. It is not about us. It is about him. And what happens so often is people look within and and they're discontent about the style. I don't really care about the style, honestly. You know what I care about? That those songs honor 
Jesus. That the preaching honors Jesus. Those are the things that are truly critical. And the survey says not only worship wars, but also prolonged meetings. Prolonged meetings. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes we have these meetings, and, 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 and thank God. Bob Coleman, you've been here the whole time I've been here. Have you ever been in the business meeting that we had that lasted more than 15 or 20 minutes? Can't remember it, can you? You know, some people have committees upon committees and meetings upon meetings, and, and all of these inconsequential things get brought up and thought about and talked about, it, and you spend so much time on those things. You beat that dead horse until that horse is completely dead. You meet, you meet, you meet, you meet, you meet. And then the main things become the insignificant things, and the insignificant things become the main things. Matthew's, Matthew 28 tells us one of the most main, the, the main main things and that's a great commission he tells us Jesus spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age listen in many churches that's kind of taken a back seat but I want you to know something that is the main thing that is the main thing. Do you want me to tell you something? When you see churches that aren't seeing anyone saved, you find other things to major on. And you major on the wrong things. And you get your eyes on yourself or on others and you become critical. But not only is the Great Commission lacking in churches like this, but also the Great Commandment is lacking. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you and that you also love one another. The, the issue of loving one another and loving God, it just goes out the window. Because when you have this who's the greatest mentality, I want to be first, then you make everything me-centered. It's all about me. And that's just the way it is. But when you start focusing on the great commission and the great commandment, you see God at work. And that's what we must do. But there's a third thing the survey says. Inordinate demand upon pastoral care. Now, I agree, every church member needs to be ministered to. But I'm going to tell you something, one person can't do it all. It takes a team effort. It means people have come to me and they said, <clears throat> well, so-and-so said nobody from the church visited them or called them. And you know what I always say to that person? What about you? you aren't you part of the church? That includes you too. Right? And, and you see, every single one of us have a divine responsibility to work for the kingdom and to change the lives of others and to be involved actively in ministry. You don't say, well, let me go get the pastor. Or let me go chew out Brother John. You know, there are times of need and crisis that the pastor should be there, if at all possible. Absolutely should be there if at all possible. However, sometimes church members have this unrealistic expectation. Well, I had a hangnail. John didn't even call me. <laughs> you know, I, I was nauseated the other night. Nobody seemed to care. Foolish things. I mean, I, I'm just going to be real honest with you. If you're doing well and you're healthy, I'm probably not going to come see you. Okay? That clear? I mean, I may, but probably not. Why? I don't have the time to chew the fat. I don't have the time. So some of you, if you just like to chew the fat, find somebody else that likes to chew the fat and has time, and you chew the fat together. Because sometimes life is so demanding, there you try to put out the hottest, biggest fires first. 
Do you know what my job is, really? 2 Timothy 2 2. Here it is. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you know what I'm supposed to do? I'm to preach the word and teach you so you can minister to others. That's my job, that's my calling. Why were the deacons selected in Acts chapter 6? Because the disciples, the apostles, couldn't take care of all the needs. So you know what they did? They assigned people responsibilities. And then those responsibilities were to be taken care of. The survey also says that dying churches, struggling churches... Churches that are going to close the doors have this attitude of entitlement. They demand special treatment. It's always about them. What's in it for me? Seriously? We have have raised a generation of people who feel entitled. It's all about me. Hands out. You know what? Give them five and tell them to get to work. That's life. Listen, don't feel entitled, survey says. These church members are also angry and hostile. Are you consistently angry? Are you hostile? Do you regularly express this hostility towards the pastor, the deacons, the teachers, church members, whoever greets you at the door? Do you have that hostility about you? Are you just angry all the time? Listen. The greatest eternal need of the world and in the community that we live in is this. That we might understand that God has a purpose for us and we need to zip the lip. Right? Don't let anything negative come out of your mouth. Don't do it. And the last thing the survey says is evangelistic apathy. Dying churches just have evangelistic apathy. It's like, well, somebody else should share with them. Let me tell you something. If you're a member of the kingdom of God, he has commanded you to open your mouth and tell others about Jesus. He's commanded you. In your workplace, where you are, do it. And, And the great command there, in Matthew chapter 28 again, verse 19, the central word there is you're to go. You're to go. And as you go, you are to minister in his name. Now, this is a test. All right? You ready to take a test? Here it is. Are you inward focused? Is it always I, me, and myself? You see, church membership needs to be from a biblical perspective. It's about servanthood. It's about ministering to others. It's about giving. It's about putting others before yourself. Why do people always want to be first? I think I've come up with five ideas. Number one, recognition. I want somebody to recognize me. I just want someone to pat me on the back and tell me how great that I am. Uh, Sometimes it's about they're afraid of being left behind or left out. Thirdly, sometimes they just crave attention. People just crave attention. They want to be the center of attention. But there's a fourth reason. Sometimes they hide weaknesses. Something in here is not right. And then fifthly, they have a desire to feel needed. Let me tell you something. If you put others before yourself and you're motivated by concern for others, let me tell you what will happen. You'll start performing small acts of ministry to others. It starts, listen to me, dads, this is Father's Day. It starts with your family. And then it goes out. Make a difference. Focus on others. Let me give you the third thing. And I know this is a short negative message, and I don't preach a lot of negative messages, but this one is negative. But let me give you a little positive here, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. I want you to see this passage of Scripture. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, did, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, 
even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that is the best attitude to have. That is the attitude of Jesus. Paul powerfully proclaimed, make this your attitude. So what did Jesus do? Four quick things Jesus did. Number one, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or used for his own advantage. You know what that means for us? Don't make church membership something to be used for your advantage. Make it for the kingdom's advantage. Secondly, he emptied himself and became a slave. He gave everything. And thirdly, he humbled himself. We are to humble ourselves before others and before Almighty God. And fourthly, he became obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. You know what we should do? We should recognize that others are so important that we're willing to serve when we feel good and when we don't. When we feel like it and when we don't feel like it, we're to go and we're to serve and we're to minister. That's what we're to do. You know, Mark's gospel, I think, puts it in a nutshell in chapter 10, verse 45. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's all about serving. It's all about giving. Now, That passage that I read in Philippians 2 isn't just a brief description of the obedience of Jesus. It's something that we're to follow. It should be our life. We are to be servants. We are to give ourselves completely. We're to put others before ourselves. This this concept of entitlement should pass away. And we need to always ask first, what can I do for the church? And the church is people. What can I do for others? How can I best serve? And let me tell you, when you come to that place, then you will have the joy that is overflowing. Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's. Dave Thomas, uh, talk about a guy who rose from nothing and became something. I, I love what he had. He said, everybody needs an MBA. You say, a master's of business? No, a mop bucket attitude that's what everybody needs a mop bucket attitude you know what I'll serve whatever it is I'll do it that's the attitude of a servant that's the attitude of a member of the kingdom of God so do you know what we need to do every single one of us we need to grab a mop and we need to grab a bucket Father, we will have an attitude of faith and we'll have an attitude of grace. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that needs to be part of this local body, they would just simply come today, give their heart, give their life, give their soul to you, and nail down their faith, their conviction, and then say, I'm here not to serve, but I'm here to serve others, not to be served. And Father, I pray that you would just take our hearts and our lives and you would make us what you've called us to be. Thank you for Jesus, this, the divine, supreme example. Lord, have your perfect will in this invitation. If we need to pray, Lord, just draw people to the altar. If they need to come and be born again, draw people here. And Lord, it's your will, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and come as you.